Hey folks, it's Marvin Cash, the host of The Articulate Fly. On this episode, I'm joined by Mark Lance. You may not know Mark, but you certainly know his photography. His images have appeared in the most prominent publications in the outdoor industry and supported the marketing efforts of many of the brands we hold dear. Please join us as Mark shares his outdoor journey. But before we get to the interview, just a couple of housekeeping items. If you like the podcast, please tell a friend and please subscribe and leave us a rating and review in the podcatcher of your choice. It really helps us out. And a shout out to this episode's sponsor. This episode's sponsored by our friends at Norvice. Their motto is, tie better flies faster, and they produce the only vice that truly spins. Tim and Tyler are launching new products just in time for the holidays. Don't get left out. Head over to www.nor-vice.com and subscribe to Norvice on your favorite flavor of social media. Now, on to the interview. Well, Mark, welcome to the Articulate Fly. Thank you, Marvin. Good to be here this evening. Yeah, I'm looking forward to our conversation, and we have a tradition on the Articulate Fly. We always ask all of our guests to share their earliest fishing memory. <laughs> That's a good place to start. Uh, yeah, my story might not be that different than uh, most of the listeners, really, and uh, maybe even strong. Um, you know, just earliest memories were uh, fishing with my father and my grandfather. Digging worms out of the garden, hooking them up to the old classic red and white bobber, and uh, going to the lake in the tin boat, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, this is all uh, kind of took place in Oklahoma. That um, that gives you a little bit of a uh, little bit of place right there where I got started fishing for bass and crappie and sunfish and perch and all that. Very neat. And uh, when did you get pulled to the dark side of fly fishing? Oh, yeah. Um, it wasn't until later, probably uh, high school, maybe uh, freshman in high school, we, uh, my family moved to Denver. And I don't know, it was it was sort of a natural thing to start looking at fly rods. And uh, at that time, there, you know, it wasn't really a huge industry or anything. I mean, guys like Lee Wolf were uh, still around fly fishing, so... That gives you a little a little bit of time frame there. But, um, yeah, um, North of Denver, fly fishing just seemed like a natural thing to do. My parents found a, an old Fenwick um, at a sport, sporting goods store and um, found an old Thompson A time vice kit, and we just started figuring it out together. Very neat. And, you know, as you kind of progressed in your fly fishing journey, who are some of the folks that mentored you, and what did they teach you? Hmm. Well, I can tell you that my first book that I ever got from the library was a fly time book by Jack Dennis, the old Western fly time, Western trout fly time manual. So I think that was probably the first uh, time that I ever really felt like I remembered reading of a certain guy and you know, his lifestyle, what he was doing, how he was tying flies, where he was fishing in Jackson Hole, all very romantic stuff, of course. Um, I think that was kind of the beginning of that. And as far as mentors along the way, I, you know, I don't really, I kind of, kind of figured that out on my own. Um, trial and error, mostly errors, I guess. But, uh, you know, you would find a guy, uh, a guide or a, a friend once in a while that throws you a hot tip just to help your casting out or help you read water, help you figure out a little entomology. But uh, I'd say no no big mentors there on the, on the fly fishing side. Uh, just uh, trial and error, seat of the pants, school of hard knocks, I suppose. Yeah, it's funny you say that because, um, you know, there's a certain vintage of us that learned all of this stuff before the internet, right? So it was really uh, going to the library, figuring it out for yourself, and maybe being lucky enough to have a club nearby. No, that's exactly right. I mean, the uh, information was, <laughs> it was scarce, and you had to dig for it, and it mainly meant going to the library once in a while, uh, or, or, you know, Digging through field and stream, sport the field, 
stuff like that, old herders uh, catalogs, and you know, just picking up, picking up hints and tips and places, and uh, you know, waiting at the mailbox once a month to get a little uh, insider information from Field and Stream instead of uh, clicking on Instagram or the internet to find <laughs> to find out what what catching where, you know. So uh, information uh, came slow, but um, that was okay. We didn't know any different back then. Yeah, there you go. And I also know you enjoy upland hunting, and I was really kind of curious, um, you know, where your appreciation of nature and, you know, your affinity for hunting and fishing came from. Yeah. Um, I think that nature and outdoor thing just kind of been in my blood ever since I was a little kid. After school, I went out in the field and goof around, find frogs or whatever, fish, in the woods, squirrels, you know, that sort of thing. Just, um, I don't know, just, just from a little kid being outdoors, that was, that was my thing. I was working outside. Um, other sports, you know, baseball and normal stuff sort of went by the base wayside so that I could spend more time uh, fishing or doing stuff with my dad or, you know, just being outdoors out in the woods, goofing around. Yeah, very neat. And, you know, even though, you know, my listeners may not know you by name, I'm sure they've seen plenty of your images because I know you've, you know, done photography for major outdoor brands, uh, for lodge, lodges and outfitters. And I was really curious about, you know, when you got the photography bug. Yeah, let's see. Well, again, uh, since I was a kid, I remember uh, borrowing my dad's little uh, little Kodak camera. It's uh, one of those bellows style things where you pull the lens out and sort of comes out like an accordion out from the camera. And, you know, we'd have that on family vacations. I enjoyed taking pictures of us just doing goofy stuff, canoeing, or, you know, running around camping at the lake and that sort of thing. But um, that kind of was a start. And, in high school, my uh, grandfather brought me home a, a used Nikon from some of his travels overseas. And it was sort of the first big camera, a uh, real camera that I had in high school. And I think I just kind of dug cameras and sort of found this little artistic side in the back of my head somewhere that uh, me and uh, got into college and shot to the yearbook and just took uh, just took pictures mainly for myself, just fun stuff, outdoor stuff, um, fishing stuff, of course, skiing, um, outdoor, outdoorsy stuff, but no, no real, oh, I don't know, I don't think I had any professional, you know, pull to go do anything like that, but uh, it was in there, it was, it was, it was in me somewhere to be taking photos and have a bit of an artistic side, and, uh, where it got me started. Um, I kind of had a, oh, Marvin, the photography thing is kind of, I don't know, waxed and waned through my, through my life, but uh, I'd get twisted off on other fun stuff like climbing or skiing or cycling or canoeing or whatever. And uh, uh, the camera would stay in the bag for months at a time, years at a time. And, um, um, I've got one little story where I, oh, one little story where I uh, took a photo of my wife who had caught a rather large fish on the frying pan. Took this picture with a little Instamatic thing I had in my uh, backpack. And uh, that picture did not do justice to the moment. <laughs> it was terrible. And at that moment, I decided right in and that was never going to happen again. So, I got back into it, pulled all my stuff out of the bag, and uh, just started uh, honing skills at that point. And uh, that really, that one picture really kind of kicked me in the butt and got me going. And <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's been, it's really been a, you know, learning process uh, from that day on, but it's been a great, it's been a great ride. And so from that jumping off point, was that kind of a point in time where you started paying more attention to other people in the field um, to kind of learn more and kind of develop a style? Oh, a little bit of style. That's a tough one. But uh, 
we can come back to that. I kind of break down this this whole idea of people in the photography world that has inspired my work. It's kind of these three eras, you know, kind of the oh, I don't know, back in the sixties and seventies, eighties, Elliot Porter, Adams, Edward Weston, and then kind of transition to more focused on photography around uh, the fly fishing world, like Brian O'Keefe and Dale Atkinson and Andy Anderson. And then today, oh my gosh, there's so many great guys out there, just an amazing, amazing bunch of uh, outdoor photographers, fly fishing photographers, um, Brian Grossenbacher, Adam Barker, Brian Gregson, bunch of people, Jess McLaughlin, she's awesome. I mean, it's <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing to just have access to how these people look at the world, how they view the world, how they photograph um, our lifestyle of photography. It's a lifestyle of photography and fly fishing. It's wow, fantastic. So all of those all of those guys have informed me my photography along the way, sometime or the other. It's been great. Yeah, very neat. Do you think the kind of the current uh, proliferation of outdoor photographers is that a shift from film to digital? And I mean, Lord knows photography is not inexpensive, but it's not as burdensome as it was, say, in the 70s or the 80s before digital photography. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, oh, you know, two big changes probably. Uh, one, obviously, is uh, sort of the transition to digital. I think they've so many more of us access to affordable, you know, equipment. Um, but then, of course, the Internet, too, allowed us all to see each other's work, share our work, share our ideas. Um, well, those two things really, I think, created the explosion. Uh, it's, it's just more accessible to have photography as a, as a creative outlet now than Days of lugging around uh, bigger cameras and hauling film down to the hauling film down to the uh, you know the processor every Monday morning and waiting a few days for Kodachrome to get processed you know hours and hours over a light table that kind of thing. It's funny you say that because I try to explain to my boys that you know you didn't just go out and shoot two hundred pictures right. Um, <laughs> and try all different kinds of stuff because you had to pay for it. Right. And if you didn't have a dark room, you were, it's harder to do contact sheets. And I remember like I would do, I would shoot stuff on slide film cause it was cheaper. Um, and then I would decide what to print, but you know, they just don't even process how inexpensive it is to take a ton of pictures and try all kinds of different stuff. Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly right. Exactly right. I mean, you can, like you said, go through 200 frames in a heartbeat and uh, pick up, the one that you like, uh, the, you know, the decisive moment, the one where your your uh, fishing buddy's eyes aren't closed, or, you know, whatever. Um, that's this part of it. And the other part is just the turnaround time, the workflow speed of digital is just so, so much more, so much faster than the film, film days. Yeah. Do you remember the first image you ever sold? <laughs> Good question. Um, I do not remember the first image. I remember where it was published was in Trout Magazine, uh, maybe 1995, give or take, maybe earlier. But I do remember my first cover. Um, I know you didn't ask that, but that picture sticks out of my mind. It's a photo of the Madison River taken from the original $3 bridge on the Madison which is now a big steel, you know, frame structure over the river. In the old days, it was just a, oh, it was just basically wooden plank bridge, and uh, the cows would come across it, you know, to get from one path to the other, and it was quite a quaint little place. But I got a really nice shot of that published in uh, Northwest Fly Fishing. And uh, so I, I remember that cover. I just don't remember my first published image. Yeah, very neat. Do you have a favorite subject that you like to photograph? Well, oh, it's got to be fly fishing at this point. Yeah, fly fishing, and of course now the wingsuit thing uh, is, is new to me, but it's um, 
Whew, it's really uh, it's really captured my uh, my uh, whole <laughs> my whole point of getting outdoors. <laughs> it's really uh, it's made a big change in uh, some of the things I'm doing. So I have play photography uh, of the fly fishing world, and uh, it's been my kind of bread and butter and my favorite thing. But uh, uh, photographing uh, working dogs and bird dogs, gun dogs, the uplands. Boy, that's that's a close second right now. Yeah, it's interesting. What is it that makes it a close second? Is it the dogs or is it something else? So dogs, I think dogs is a huge piece of it. But the other piece is, uh, you know, the landscape, the, the geography of wind shooting and fly fishing really isn't that different. I mean, there are a lot of places I can I can go hunt my dog and in the morning and go fishing in the afternoon. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of common, there's a lot of common ground between the two, I think. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. I think it's, I'm always amazed. I don't get to bird hunt as much as I like, but I'm always just, uh, blown away at how happy the dogs are. (laughs) Yep. They're happy. They are happy, happy, happy. They're happy to be there. And, uh, um, yeah, when they're doing what their DNA tells them to do, they are they are right to behold, and they are a blast to be around. Um, I was actually photographing a fly fishing slash wing shooting lodge on the west coast of Colorado uh, when I well, it's been a few years now, and I had an opportunity to go out and photograph some guys that uh, were working their dogs on. Uh, uh, just planted pheasants and, you know, it was kind of a, a dude ranch sort of situation. But man, when I saw those dogs working, I just went and I, I thought this was the coolest thing I've ever seen. And it was really the first, kind of the first time I'd ever really seen it live. And, uh, to be able to photograph the interaction of the hunters and the dog and, uh, just, just how the whole, the whole dance came together was just amazing. I was hooked. Two years later, I ended up with a dog and um, a shotgun, and I'm learning, still learning the ropes. But uh, yeah, it's really, it's really been wonderful. Yeah, it's probably uh, slightly more expensive than fly fishing, too. Well, it is. It, it can be. It can be. <laughs> <laughs> you can. I can see where a guy can get carried away pretty easily, but yeah, yeah. Starting, starting with. Uh, Starting with dog power, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, as long as we don't throw a jet sled into the fishing uh, paradigm, I think, you know, the, the bird hunting is going to be way more expensive than the fly fishing. Yeah, Marvin, I've already been down that road with the steelhead bug. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, I have a very understanding life, or it would, uh, yeah, or I'd be living in a two wide trailer somewhere in Wyoming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, there you go. Well, you know, before we talk about your writing, um, tell me a little bit about how you think about your style as a photographer. That's a killer. I don't, I struggle with that topic. I, I struggle with that topic. Um, I don't know. I, I'm a self-trained photographer, really, in, in a way that sort of translates to uh, untrained photographer. And then kind of at the end of the day, it almost uh, translates to sort of a hodgepodge of styles. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I can pin myself down or you could pin me down on a on a style, but uh, I can tell you that this is probably inconsistent, if anything. Um, I try to be technically sound and have a little bit of creativity, but not not a great deal of creativity. Just Just, <laughs> just my style is a little bit of creativity. What interesting photos, you know, stuff that just um, captures the moment. Maybe photos that don't don't necessarily uh, tell a story. I, I kind of think of my my photos taking uh, taking on um, maybe taking on a paragraph or a sentence rather than a whole story. So um, mainly small, intimate subjects rather than big, you know, big topics. Um, I don't know. That's 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 a tough one. That'll probably remain a tough question for me. But I just shoot. I just like it. Sometimes stuff works. Sometimes it doesn't. Uh, I don't. I'm not sure. I can pin myself down on a particular style. 
Yeah. I mean, I certainly see that sentence, not a paragraph or an entire paper in that article that just came out in the Upland Hunting uh, edition of Strung, where you had the picture uh, of the pheasant. And then you had several pictures, I think, of like the feet of the game birds with like maybe a broken open shotgun. Um, They were very interesting, right? Very different perspective. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was cool. Um, I got to give some credit to the uh, photo editors of that magazine because you know, they see a lot of my photos and they pick, they pick the ones that can tell a story or that can actually help the viewer dig a little deeper. Like, like you suggested, those three images of the feet of game birds were three different birds. And, you know, the guys that are into it can nail those birds. They know exactly what the birds those were and uh, sort of tie that back into the story and then Hopefully we reach some guys that uh, do a little wing shooting, do a little photography, and, you know, get their creative juices flowing too, thinking of all the feathers of these birds and how they can be worked into fly patterns that they, you know, that they already tie or maybe inspire them to tie, uh, tie some new patterns. Yeah, it's funny you say that because I specifically thinking about the picture of the pheasant skin. And I was like, I was just literally just scouring that photo, thinking about all the different feathers that were on it. Um, and what you could tie pretty amazing. Um, and you know, in addition to being a photographer, you're also an outdoor writer. You know, when did the writing bug get you? Oh, I think, I think the writing came from my work, actually, um, my nine to five job or eight to five job. Um, it's kind of a technical, writer about um, geology and geophysics um, software, basically, in the oil and gas industry, oil and gas exploration. So I did a lot of uh, uh, technical marketing on that side and around uh, oil and gas exploration. And um, the, the, I don't know, just the more creative, fun side of writing an experiential story around fly fishing that it sort of came later when a when basically an editor said, "I don't I don't know how you're going to sell any photos, Mark, if you can't write a story." So basically, <laughs> I had a little inspiration there because I thought I was a photographer, not a writer. But I realized that you know it really helped to be able to do some writing. Get you got my foot in the door in a lot of places to uh, sort of provide uh, you know a bigger set of content than just photography or just the story felt like I could bring the whole sort of bring a whole package to an editor and uh, I think it paved the way for me a little bit to, to kind of get going on the writing and I, I realized that uh, I had a bit of a knack for it I mean I'm not a great writer but you know I love telling a good story about being outdoors and it's usually uh, not fiction it's usually truth or <clears throat> based on truth uh, on that on the real, on the real deal, you know, a real experience and so forth and about places and sometimes people and fish and experiences and it just kind of, kind of came somewhat natural. And it's interesting too. I always like to ask all of my writers about how they like to write. So I find, you know, there's some people that are like, I get up at four o'clock in the morning and I do two hours every day. And then there are other people that, you know, they'll go close themselves in a room for a month and write a book. Um, how do you like to approach the process? Yeah, I think uh, I think the time the time that I spend writing is a bit more. Uh, it, it's not planned as much as uh, it's not as structured. I should say. I think the creative for me, the creative things, the creative words, the thoughts that ramble through my head aren't. Don't come to me when I'm just sitting there staring at a, <laughs> staring at a computer. So, so the guys that can get up and devote two hours, man, my hats are off to those guys. But I'm not one of them. I'm a little more ad hoc than that. Uh, I might put half a story together just out riding my bike or doing a hike or, you know, bits and pieces of a story while I'm out training my dog just in my head. I'm kind of doing stuff and pieces come together and then the polish the polish comes to it uh, when I at, at the end when I sit down and pull the pieces together and uh, again I'm, I'm not inspired by the clock I'm sort of 
not driven by the clock, but sort of uh, have to wait for a quiet time in the day. And I don't know, spark this hip, uh, sit down and take advantage of it, push everything else aside, and uh, when the spark's there, man, I got I to gotta write. No, absolutely. Um, are there any outdoor writers or authors that you like to read or follow? Um, there are, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I read uh, all of John McPhee's books. Uh, John McPhee uh, does a lot of writing about um, theology around the West, um, theology in the East. Um, he's got a couple of, he's got a good book on Alaska. Um, I really like his stuff. Um, I read John Garrett for a good laugh. I read Bill Bryson for a good laugh. Um, Bill Bryson is a, a, to me, a really a, a really great way to create a sense of place and time that he's writing and, uh, experiences. But, um, you know, he, he seems to have a lot of, uh, oh, I don't know. He, he's a humble guy, but, has a lot of humor in his writing that I, I really find uh, good. And uh, one other guy I really like reading is uh, uh, Mark Jenkins, great adventure writer. I mean, just gripping adventure kind of stuff and uh, um, all true stories and just, just amazing experiences that guy has written about. So those are probably three modern day guys that I like to read. Oh, and the on the uh, wing shooting side, uh, Jim Fergus, A Hunter's Road, that's, I think is probably a classic, but was a great one for a guy like me just getting into the wing shooting. Good, good writer, Jim Fergus. Great, uh, great storytelling. Uh, very neat. And I think I know the answer to this question, um, but I'm going to ask it anyway. If you had to pick between photography and writing, which one would you choose? <laughs> Yeah, photography for sure. Yeah. Not because I'm lazy, lazy, but it's just the visual creativity um, somehow just draws me to that. I hope I hope I can always do a little dabble with the writing, but uh, if someone took my pen away from me or my computer, I would uh, definitely not let them take my camera away from me. Yeah, got it. And, you know, another thing that's interesting, and I've been lucky to have um, a lot of folks who have been able to, um, I think, through kind of determination and probably a little bit of luck to get their passion to be their day job. And, you know, I know, as you mentioned earlier in the interview, that you had a career in oil and gas, but you now are able to pursue your photography, your writing, and your outdoor interests full time. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how you were able to do it. Cause I know so many people that are like, gosh, I really like this. I wish I could make this my life's work and not do my nine to five thing anymore. So would love any tips. Yeah. yeah, Tips, tips and secrets you may have, or just kind of the, (laughs) I know that you had your photography business before you left oil and gas, like what that progression was like kind of building the foundation to do this today. Yeah. You know, Marvin, I was, I was a rabid weekend warrior. I mean, just, You've got to put the energy into your passion, whether it's the photography or the fishing, and sometimes you have to just mix and match those so that they all can work together, you know. But basically, weekends and um, every every vacation day, you know, through my whole career was fishing, fishing and photography and a little bit of writing, and I never really had I never really had the gumption to. Hey, no, I'm not going to do my, uh, I'm not going to do my day job anymore because I kind of like my day job. I guess it was, uh, you know, I, I enjoyed that. So, but I can tell you this: it did afford me to be able to go places. Um, made me, you know, allowed me to be able to afford to go places and write. And when, when I was able to retire, um, it was just a natural fit to just keep writing and keep keep doing the photography, but I uh, could do it a bit on my own schedule rather than uh, being that weekend warrior guy. Um, so, you know, I, I don't really, I don't think I have any advice for anybody. I mean, except keep the passion, keep the passion alive, man. Keep yeah. the flame flicker and whatever you have to do. You got to wash dishes or be a guide or, <laughs> you know, a bus driver or whatever. Just keep the passion alive for the weekends and, 
communications and don't ever let it burn out. Just got to keep it going. Yeah, it's interesting too. And since you, you know, you lived in the Denver area, you know, I suspect that that was a great laboratory for you because, you know, as long as I've been going to Colorado and Denver, I'm always amazed at how much the people that live there love living there. No, that's true. It's, you know, I live in near Denver, a suburb of Denver, and it's, it's a big enough town. A guy can make a good living and uh, use his schooling to get, uh, get a good job, but you're right out your back door is, man, some great stuff. I mean, Colorado's awesome. Wyoming's not that far away. In Mexico, Utah, I mean, for a fly fishing guy, you can be to a lot of places for a long weekend uh, from Denver. So, yeah, it's definitely, uh, it was definitely a, an advantage to me to be in the mountains. That's near the mountains. It was always inspiring, inspiring stuff for a photographer or writer. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's neat. And, you, you know, I, preparing for this interview, uh, read your article and strung that we mentioned, and I'll drop a link to it, uh, in the show notes for sure. It, but one of the things that really struck me reading that article, um, was I had a real, uh, sense of your reverence for the experience of, um, of fishing and hunting and making your own flies and also just that connection to the natural world. And I just wanted, wondered if you could talk a little bit about, your perspective and kind of how it came to be. Marvin, that's kind of heavy. It is kind of heavy, but I was really, I mean, I was really struck by the article. I mean, I, you know, I read a ton of outdoor stuff and I was like, wow, this is, um, you know, this is somebody who's really has a very deep connection, uh, to our natural world and, um, has a real reverence for being in the field. Right. right. Well, I don't know. I, I mean, from childhood, I've enjoyed being outdoors and wildlife, the fishing, the, you know, just wild places, fantastic. So, so I think some of that just began from when I was a child. The, the reverence piece, um, I don't know. I just, that just could be sort of a reflection of my uh, just demeanor in general, you know. I'm not... Uh, I'm not a real, I don't know how to say it, but uh, there's a lot of joy when I do these things, these pursuits, lots of joy, but it's really not the show. It's just more internal for me mm-hmm. somehow. Uh, there's not driven by some sense of conquest, as I mentioned in that article. It's just, uh, even though I like sharing the experiences, it's really not the show. It's mainly internal. Um, I just think uh, we all, should be really, really, really careful with Mother Nature. (laughs) Um, um, You know, I don't know. That's that's kind of a tough one to uh, describe. I I mean, um, it can, you know, fly fishing and wing shooting both can be kind of these sort of quiet, personal pursuits. And uh, that's more or less how I, more or less how I approach them. Um, yeah, I, I have one little story I can tell you that kind of reflects somewhat on this question was uh, when I was first, first time I got to do uh, photography, as I was mentioning uh, earlier in the podcast, around wing shooting. Um, one of the fellows had uh, his, you know, I saw some good dog work, nice point. The guy knocked down his bird. Dog brings it back to him. And I asked him, I said, how do I, how do I photograph this? What should I do? I didn't really, hadn't done it. I didn't really know what to do. And he just looked at me and says, Mark, just respect the bird. That's all you got to do. Just respect the bird. And so that sort of stuck with me. Respect the fish, respect the bird. Um, the, I, I think the rest just kind of falls into place if you, if you do those things. Respect mother nature. Um, that's just sort of. It's just sort of how do I approach it when I go outdoors and fish and hunt and take photos and I don't know if that even came close to answering your question. <laughs> no, it does. I mean, I and it and part of the answer really resonated with me too because I, you know, it's funny because the people are kind of surprised sometimes that I don't want to take pictures of fish. 
Um, and that's not to say that I never take pictures of fish, but it's really kind of to your point, you know, that's my moment, right? I don't need a picture, right? Um, and so I rarely, rarely do that. So, I mean, I, I, I completely, I don't say I completely understand it. I, 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 I certainly understand your answer, I guess. Yeah, you do. You understand it. Um, yeah, you know, uh, the old grip and grin photo thing, you know, just sort of drove so many photographers for so long. I'm, I'm pretty happy that era is somewhat over, at least with the serious photographers and, you know, this whole keep them wet movement. Um, great stuff, you know, it's just, you can document all of this without taking a fish out of the water and grabbing it with your grubby mitts and <laughs> getting a photo of a silly guy, you know, aiming, aiming the fish at the camera. But uh, we all do it. We all done it. But there's so much more to it if you uh, stop and think about it. So hopefully we all will. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. It makes me think about, you know, I, I one thing I do do religiously is I keep a fishing journal. Um, and not a, like this was the temperature of the moon phase, but literally just every day that I'm on the water, I just write one little short page, uh, usually at the end of the day with a, a beer or a, uh, spirit, um, and write mm-hmm. that out. Right. Just so, um, and I don't usually go back and look at it, but it's just something I wanted to have for my boys so they could go back and kind of flip through that and kind of see what, you know, my, my years of fishing looked like. Right. Right. Yeah. Hey, well, I'll, I'll say this: if you want to take a grip and grand picture of your boys, man, I think you should. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, absolutely. <laughs> I, I do have some of those. I mean, I, I would tell you probably the most amazing thing, and you'll get a kick out of this, is um, my old my oldest son, who's now eighteen. Uh, when he was very young, like say five or six, he always wanted to come fish with me. And, um, I, Perfect. yeah, well, I kept telling him what I did is I said, well, you know, you don't listen well enough to be in a drift boat. Um, but this kind of culminated when he was, um, almost eight years old. Um, I took him, uh, on a trip to Montana with the family and we hit the salmon fly hatch on the upper Madison. Ooh, fantastic. And, you know, he's in the back of the boat with an eight weight, um, crushing it. And, you know, he's at the put in at Story's Ditch with a fly that he designed showing all the guides and they think it's a hoot. And, uh, you know, he comes home and he just thinks everybody catches, you know, 18 to 24 inch trout on salmon flies. And (laughs) right. I've had to explain to him that there are people that go their entire lives that never get to fish that hatch. Yep. Yep. No, that's, that's wonderful. But but it takes sometimes it takes that to get a kid completely over the top hook, you know, and that's fantastic, fantastic opportunity that you had to go fish with him and he got to really see a fantastic day. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And, you know, it's interesting too, because, um, from talking to you before the interview and reading your article, I, I can tell that there's a very definite kind of seasonal arc to your sporting life. And um, I was wondering, you know, if you could kind of share with us what a year in the field uh, with Mark Lance looks like. <laughs> okay, let's do a let's do a pre-COVID um, typical year. How about that? That sounds fair. <laughs> well, before I started wing shooting, it was it was all fly fishing, and uh, you know that's that spring, summer, fall, and winter. I mean, it's um, it's a year round pursuit really. And then when you throw in species and places in North America and South America, you can pretty much stay busy the whole year. And I really tried to do that, you know, opportunities to photograph for a lodge and, uh, you know, North America, um, in our summer and then in uh, our winter, well, it's summer in South America and, I maybe have an opportunity to go photograph a lot down there. So, so it was a year round whirlwind, really. It was pretty cool. Um, all four, all four seasons. And I picked out a few, I always pick out a few times, uh, times of the year where I fish for myself. And it, Marvin, I, it turned out in the last 10 years or so that the times I picked out to go fish for myself, typically turned out to be the dead of winter in North America. <laughs> and um, I know I missed a lot of great hatches. I know I missed great hatches. But 
I had rivers to myself, which is kind of at some point you will you you just appreciate that, you know. So uh, to catch five fish a day or one fish a day or to get skunk sometimes when you have an entire river to yourself is uh, way more valuable than you know hitting a hatch of a lifetime uh, with forty other boats on the river and you know what I mean, just just the crowd that. Uh, that uh, sort of naturally occurred these days, but um, yeah, so that that arc was that was a big circle, man. It wasn't well, the arc just kept going, <laughs> and and then uh, then the whole bird dog thing got uh, thrown in, and then the you know the wing shooting up one thing got thrown in just the last few years. So it sort of changed the tra- tra- trajectory a bit. Um, seems like I still miss those great hatches because I'm. Uh, at home training my bird dog, preparing for the fall. <laughs> so, and then fall comes, and I'm torn between torn between great fishing destinations and great wing shooting opportunities. You know, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, wherever. I mean, the and the ski uh, uh kind of have their flashpoints for the season. You sort of want to be there for that. So. Um, um, so fishing kind of has gone on the back burner just a week yet until, uh, again, until after January 31st, and, uh, the springtime kicks in and I can work in some fishing and, uh, um, get back to some, gradually get back into bird dog training and, uh, then suddenly I find the cycle has uh, begun all over again. Yeah, very neat. And, you know, you've been around the sport, uh, for a while, um, I was just kind of curious, you know, on your perspective on what's kind of changed um, since you've been fly fishing and been out in the field bird hunting. Yeah. Um, now there's some there's some big changes. I mean, I've kind of been at it for a while, so kind of date myself a bit here. But we talked, uh, we mentioned about uh, sort of the information boom uh, a little earlier when we talked about. Uh, internet and social media and so forth. So one huge thing that's changed is just access to information, whether it's the hot bug on the Henry's Fork, you know, on July 26th or whatever. You could pretty much nail it down. Somebody has, has the info. Um, you know, when I first started, you know, it was basically, it was basically going to the library and checking out a book and learning what you could. So, so sort of this information explosion is a big change, huge change. And I would say that there's also a big change in the equipment. Uh, you know, fundamentally, a uh, fly, fly rod, and a reel. Yeah, but, boy, it's changed. I mean, the materials are fantastic. Beautiful quality of uh, the work. Fly rods, lines, reels, even clothing. I mean, good grief. Um Thankfully, I don't have to wear army surplus stuff anymore to go fishing. You know, it's a big transition from from army surplus gear to you know down coats and Gore-Tex jackets, and you know we we've, we've got it made. We have access to so much great equipment. Um, so those are huge, two big changes. I think um, the crowds, the crowds. That's a big change. A lot more people on the water now. Absolutely. Um, changes in the photography world, too, that we mentioned earlier, just uh, from film to digital, has um, uh, really been a revolution. A, a good one, I think. I, I can't imagine going back to film, although there are some really uh, creative, wonderful photographers that, that do film still, and, and my hats are off to them, but I, I think now I don't have the patience. I'm, I'm hooked. I'm hooked on the workflow of digital, so um, that's that's another big change over my career for sure. And, and kind of as you look over those, are are there any parts of those, or is there anything else that kind of gives you any pause or any concern about you know the future of outdoor sports and our sporting traditions? Um, maybe a little bit. I mean, um, there are a lot more people on the planet now that want to want to fly fish, so. You know, we as just a population just put 
more pressure on on the habitat and on the resource, and so in a way, there's maybe a little more about degradation habitat or natural resources, that sort of thing, just in general. Um, you know, there are bigger forces at play um, that have little regard for the for the natural world, too. But, um, you know, some of those bigger pieces aside, uh, just on a local level and national level, um, uh, there's, there's a little bit of concern. But, you know, the other side of the coin is, uh, on the other hand, we have... You know, we still have a lot of people that will doom themselves to, uh, you know, an old growth forest tree or a bulldozer to, you know, to bring attention to, um, you know, degradation of a resource or a river or, you know, a mountainside from mining and so forth, like Pebble Mine, uh, for example, um, you know, some of the dams and so forth. But so, so on the other hand of these, these negative things, there are so many positive things. I mean, People are able to build coalitions via the internet now to, you know, create awareness and, and to fight some of these, uh, these, uh, these things that are going on in our environment. So that's huge. And that's, uh, that's the future. I mean, they, there's a whole new generation of guys that are way sharper than my generation in terms of, uh, being able to coalesce a, a group of, group of people that can, Sort of, hey, let's just say, save the planet, save the local river, the watershed, whatever, whatever it is. I mean, there's, there are people out there that can pull it off these days because of, uh, um, you know, social media, the internet, just the speed of information. So, so on the one hand, yep, there's concerns, but on the other hand, I think, uh, I think there's a lot of, a lot of good things that that are going to come from, uh, from a uh, you know, a younger generation of outdoor. You know, Outdoorsmen and outdoor women, and and you know, I think I think the future is. Um, we have to be cautious. We have to keep our ears uh, ears open and be diligent. But I, I think I think we're going to be in good shape. Yeah, that's a really kind of a a great note to kind of wrap things up tonight. And before I let you go, Mark, why don't you let folks know where they can find you on the internet and uh, follow all of your photography and your upland hunting and all your fly fishing adventures. Yeah, well, I do a little bit on uh, Instagram. Um, probably not as regular as I uh, would like, but uh, folks can find some some of the stuff I'm up to recently uh, at Riverlight Images on Instagram. And that happens to be my URL for uh, my website also. Uh, it's www.riverlightimages.com. And uh, I know some of the listeners will be thinking light and then light beer, but no, light is in L I G H C, so riverlightimages.com. And uh, you can see some of the some of the stuff uh, I've done lately and some of the stuff I've done in the past. And keep track of me that way. That'd be, that'd be fun to hear from some of you guys. Yeah, that's awesome. And I'll drop all that stuff in the show notes and I'll make sure that we don't have a Miller, Miller Light Beer uh, URL problem. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, Mark, I super appreciate you carving some time out this evening to chat with me. Thanks, Marvin. It was great. Yeah. We'll uh, cross paths again, I hope. Yeah, absolutely. Take care. You bet. Good night. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed that as much as we enjoyed bringing it to you. Again, if you like the podcast, please tell a friend and please subscribe and leave us a review in the podcatcher of your choice. Tight lines, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving.